Shall we start? Okay. Eight. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am starting. Um, <clears throat> so, in the last two days, um, from the last like past one week, uh, what we were doing was dealing with the basics of molecular biology and then we covered on the one day uh, fully with your um, microscopy and another day we deal with the all types of your uh, cell culture techniques yesterday all the animal cell culture that we use day to day life how we do it what are the things we have to be taken care so we deal with that yesterday and today um, we are done with quite like we prepared ourselves now uh, we are ready to go in the lab and do various techniques so let's uh, have a look over them how we do it how it is done in the lab and with some virtual videos uh, behind them and uh, some principle basic principle so within this picture you can see a complete summary of this presentation uh, where I have brought you with the Sanger sequencing. Uh, this is the Rhabdopsis thaliana uh, with the <coughs> fits uh, being, being uh, generated in that. And beyond that here you can see some uh, horizontal gel electrophoresis. Some cells uh, being seen in the microscope. A cat, a human growth hormone being given to the HGH hormone to the mouse. So that you can see a very large growth of the mouse here some DNA microarray uh, with the yellow, red and green light and the circular on the DNA chip being shown. So beyond that <coughs> in this part we will be dealing with the majorly um, five different topics. First we will deal with the analysis of nucleic acids under which we will deal with PCR, gel electrophoresis, blotting techniques. A little bit little not too in details. Now we will uh, go through them in details later with the gel electrophoresis and blotting technique. Then we deal with the GN expression analysis uh, with the help of real time PCR microarrays DNA chips. Uh, then recombinant DNA technologies, cloning of DNA fragments. Then Sanger sequencing and next generation sequencing. Then methods to study gene functions, so cell culture methods, uh, generation of transgenic mouse and knockout mouse. So that will be the goal uh, 
in today lecture i will try to make things done till micro arrays maybe if we are good we can continue to recombinant dna technology the rest we do tomorrow from the sanger sequencing and a next generation sequencing so it will be not much today maybe half an hour of workshop but whatever we do uh, we do slowly and and nicely so let's start <coughs> that was the introduction part so if you remember if you go into the lab and you you were asked in the lab practicals that you have to isolate some dna and then you went to maybe to the field get some leaves petiole and you started to extract dna and what you see that after extracting the dna that you get your dna nanogram per ml you get very little amount from two or three leaves a very little amount of dna not much even when you start to extract dna from your uh, mouth uh, buccal cavity or from your skin from your hair follicles any anything you get always very nanogram uh, amount of your dna which is not sufficient to do your experiments so in order to solve that mystery um carry mulus uh, who got the nobel prize winner in the chemistry 1993 for the invention of pcr he has many uh, successfully published paper in science and nature uh, about this technique so in this method what we do is you have a, a particular target sequence and you and you make a millions of copies of that sequence by just changing the temperature and adding some ingredients to it so the ingredients that we add into it uh, is buffer template dna primers nucleotides dna polymerase and water and in this method we used uh, to amplify rare specific dna sequence from a complex mixture uh, where the end of sequences are known then pcr amplifications of mutant alleles allow the detection of human genetic diseases these are the applications and can be amplified by pcr which could be used for cloning pro process uh, also in the forensics so here on the right hand side what you can see here is uh, the, you have a genomic dna with the target sequence one with the 5 to 3 prime other is 3 to 5 prime and then the cycle one yields two molecules so how it yields two molecules in the first cycle by three methods d a e this is i always tend to remember uh, even i tell to my students d a and e so in the d a e what is happening is uh, denaturation annealing extension in denaturation we increase them to the temperature of around 94 degrees celsius very high temperature so that the your two strands are separated then annealing we cool cool it uh, so that primers could form to the hydrogen bond with the target sequence so we make it to 50 to 56 degrees celsius here it depends upon your primers how much is your primer melting point is then the extension is done with the help of tac polymerase are added to there and then with the help of your dntps you have full uh, full fledged sequence uh, being made so that's how uh, this is done around 72 degrees celsius yeah so in this way you have your first cycle being done and this cycle continues so in the sec second cycle you have four molecules in the third cycle you have eight and by the end you have millions of copies by the 35th cycle on the left hand side this is the thermal cycler you you are seeing here so we use this 96 well plate uh, small plastic um uh, well plates and this is the thermal cycler we uh, organize the temperature this is 4 in 1 actually so you can run four pcrs at once uh, on the parallel and yeah pretty pretty advanced uh, at the moment further then after the pcr you can check that how much your PC, uh, dna is being produced so for that you can use uh, a dna fragments of different sizes so you have your dna restriction fragments yeah you restrict them with the restriction enzyme then you uh, apply them on the agrose or polyacrylate gel then on the well what you will see is there will be some uh, there will be negative and positive charge as your dna is negatively charged it will move from top to bottom and and by the end of the reaction uh, you will see the large particles of your dna will be on the top and the smaller will be at the bottom so in this way molecules move through the pores in gel at rare inversely proportional to their chain length 
and the, on the right hand side you can see the visualization of DNA or RNA molecules which are separated by gel electrophoresis this is uh, on the first or on the, on the end uh, the various molecular markers here of the different sizes 1 kilo base pair uh, around 2 kilo base pair 3 kilo base pair 4 8 like that and in between is a different clones here five clones are there uh, showing different DNA fragments so in the first DNA fragment you can see that there are two um, two gels are there then on the second two clones here on the third like that so like this this continues yeah uh, further uh, in the analysis of nucleic acids instead uh, beyond your gel electrophoresis and uh, your polyacrylamide gel page you can also go for uh, checking of your DNA and mRNA for the DNA of uh, checking uh, fragments you do your southern blotting for checking out your mRNA you mostly do your uh, northern blotting and for the protein you do your western blotting so SNW, so always remember SNW with uh, DRP, a way to remember uh, this uh, S and, and W with D R P. So S for Southern, that is DNA. Um, and for northern, for RNA, W for western, that is protein. <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry for that. Uh, in the southern blotting, here we are checking the question is, is the specific sequence in DNA uh, present in my DNA sample? The specific sequence that you are seeing, uh, is it present in your DNA sample? So, you run on the gel electrophoresis. Uh, your DNA is there, you strict them with the enzyme, then you put uh, with the capillary action, you transfer to the nitrocellulose membrane. After transferring to the nitrocellulose membrane, you hybridize with DNA and you have RNA probe, then yes, you can see your hybridized uh, DNA particle to be here. So the specific part, is it present? Uh, if it is present, it will be there. So yes, answer is yes. On the other hand, uh, second question about northern blotting is here is the beta globin gene is expressed is mRNA present in my total mRNA because there is a total RNA sample present and there is a messenger RNA present so our question is a specific beta globin gene is expressed or not so we run this total RNA we took the total RNA of our sample then we run the gel electrophoresis then we transfer like again the nitrocellulose membrane then hybridized uh, with the labeled uh, RNA probe here not DNA probe, RNA probe should be there, it's wrong. And then you can see here is, this is at 0 hours, 48 hours, 96 hours. So at the size of around 0 0.6 K, uh, K, 6, 5 kilo base pairs, uh, in the 48 hours, the beta globin mRNA started to show. At the 96, it's fully expressed. So yes, its expression increases over the time. So your mRNA beta globin is present in your total RNA. So the question and answer to that is, uh, answer to your question uh, is that yes, it is expression increases over the time with this beta globin mRNA. So in these cases with southern and northern blotting, different techniques would help you to get different results. Now comes, this is the very common technique that we are using uh, in our day to day life here. In the COVID test, uh, we will understood how the COVID test is also done. That is your real-time PCR for gene expression analysis. So there are two types of PCRs that we discussed on the first day. Uh, there is a reverse transcription uh, PCR, RT-PCR, and there is a real-time PCR, quantitative uh, real-time PCR. So in the in the reverse transcription, first you change your step is to convert your RNA to complementary DNA, and then you check your results on the real-time level of your PCR. The how much uh, how much PCR like how much DNA amplification is done per cycle you can calculate it on the real time basis so here what it, it is written here that real time PCR for gene expression analysis this allows a real time monitoring for PCR amplifications product by using the fluorosense technique actually so in the first step we convert them to the complementary DNA of your RNA with the help of reverse transcription 
then either we do quantitative or semi quantitative measurement that is quite a highly sensitive technique I am mostly using the research lab and clinical diagnostic labs. So what we do is first you have a halogen tungsten lamp uh, which has exciting excitation filters uh, which uh, go you can see the blue light uh, goes and on the bottom uh, is your plate your uh, 96 well plate off with the samples so they go at the bottom and it is illuminate the fluorescence lights to the another prism to the another mirror here and this go transmitted to the emission filters then they were, they were intensify and then we can check them at the CCD chip. So this is kind of indirect method with the fluorescence technique in order to identify your um, results that how much fluorescence is being present, how much your DNA amplification is being done. So this is how you pl plot your PCR in real time. So these are the cycle like around 34 to 35. So amount of DNA per each cycle so at the first cycle 2, 4, 8, 16. So by the end you have um, a lot, 1 crore, 50, 580 lakh, um, yeah, like this. It's a huge amount of DNA being produced by the end. So amount of DNA <coughs> being produced uh, goes initially slowly, slowly, but then uh, exponentially increases. And these are the cycle number, uh, per each cycle number, how much DNA is being produced. So it's all linear. Then after 30th, 35th cycle, it's linear then but initially it's uh, yeah proportional to each other so this is how you uh, calculate your uh, relative expression values uh, rev so for the amplification curve so what you have is on the la x axis there's a fluorescence on the y axis oh, sorry on the x axis uh, is the cycle number on the y axis is fluorescence so initially uh, by the 10th cycle 20th cycle nothing will happen but you have sample A and B, they will give different results. Uh, they will exponentially increase, called as log linear phase. And afterwards, they will go straight linear again. So the way, the time it started to have log linear phase, the first point we will call as in the cycle number CTA. And the first sample B will be CTB. Yeah. And then to calculate the relative fourth chain uh, for the semi-quantitative uh, semi quantitative QPCR, this is the formula E target upon E reference. So E target is delta CP. You subtract these values from control minus sample and the reference value uh, from control minus sample. Reference will be your water here and the target values in the control and, and then, then you check them. So let's see how we do it. How the sample are being prepared for the RT-PCR. We will show this. So first you prepare the reaction mixture with the 2x stack 1 master mix, 24 5 microliter per sample. So this will have everything, the master mix uh, will have all your ingredients that you are looking for, magnesium, chloride, forward. Now we will add forward primer to it, that is 5 microliter of sample. <coughs> then we add reverse primer, 5 microliter of sample to the reaction mixture. Then Tuckman probe, five microliter per sample. Then we allocate this uh, mixture into the ninety-six well plate. Then we add complementary DNA sample, ten microliter into those uh, uh, real-time mixture that we have made, master mix. <coughs> then cover the plate with the micro seal film.
Then you put your plate into the real-time PCR machine and run the program. So these are the like in the 96 well plate. So from third row and B column. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight wells are filled with our samples. So we select them, and then we uh, in the previous one what you saw is is the different temperatures. Uh, 95, around 640, 60, then again 60. So it depends upon how your action has to go. Then you run this program, it will go for 35 cycles. Then you analyze the results. So here you can see the peaks that I was telling you, um, uh, the data cycle numbers are there on the bottom. On the top is the uh, DNA fluorescence being produced, the peaks. And for each sample, so one, two, they are done in duplicates so that the things are fine. So we have eight, one. So here we can see different peaks going up, 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 up like that. So we will have the results in figures and we make a standard curve Yeah, and that's it. So I'm not going more into the practical part here. So just to have you have a uh, uh, good evening, good evening. Uh, just to have you experience uh, with the RT-PCA technique, uh, how we do it and how things are working in the real sense. So that was the real-time PCR. Now let's, uh, we have understood the basics of your uh, real-time PCR, how we do it technically. Now let's go to how we use this application in, in, in this today's world that we are, it's a very tough time for us at the moment um, because of this COVID-9 with the second strain coming up, which is somehow very brutal and it doesn't let anyone think or any do think of the immune system. It just attacked your immune system and make you vulnerable. So recently in my college, the Dean Sir has been totally throttled because of this virus. And um, many faculties are being under, under this arena of this uh, COVID-19. Many of my relatives are under this. So please, <clears throat> my request to whosoever is being attending this class, um, be, be cautious. Even though you, uh, some of you might have the COVID-19 injections, but this strain uh, is even powerful than vaccine actually. So stay home, pray to the God and so that everyone is remain healthy. No one should be affected and everyone should get out of this uh, pandemic wave that is being there, second wave of COVID-19 that we are able to survive if it is God will. Otherwise, um, yeah. So let's see things get better for us. So let's have an overview that uh, whenever you're going for COVID-19, uh, even though I don't want to share these things because all in the news channel everywhere we are just discussing about COVID-19, nothing else, which makes you also quite vulnerable and weak inside uh, from the mentally point of view. But anyhow, <clears throat> we should know what is the principle behind it. Uh, to be more focused here that we are here for MBBT workshop during this time. And let's get uh, what what inside is it. I will play this video and it will explain things. COVID-19 is caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. When a person is infected, the most common symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. To start a test, the samples can be collected by a nasopharyngeal swab or an oropharyngeal swab. For nasopharyngeal specimen, the swab is inserted in the nostril and gently moved forward into the nasopharynx. Then it is rotated for a specified period time to collect secretions that contain the virus. Once the swabbing is applied, the swab is placed immediately into sterile tube containing a viral transport medium. The standard method of coronavirus testing is polymerase chain reaction, PCR which is a method that used widely in molecular biology to make millions to billions of copies of a specific DNA fragment rapidly. 
Coronaviruses contain an extraordinarily long single-stranded RNA genome. To detect these viruses with PCR, RNA molecules must be converted into their complementary DNA sequences by reverse transcriptase. Then the newly synthesized DNA can be amplified by standard PCR procedures. This approach is universally known as RT-PCR. To perform this method, basically viral RNA should be extracted. Several RNA purification kits are available for convenient, fast and effective isolation. To extract the viral RNA by using commercial kit, the sample is first added into a microcentrifuge tube. Then it is mixed with a lysis buffer. This buffer is highly denaturing and is usually consists of phenol and guanidine isothiocyanate. Also, RNA inhibitors are usually present in the lysis buffer to ensure isolation of intact viral RNA. Once the lysis buffer is added, the tube is mixed by pulse vortexing and incubated at room temperature. Then the virus is lysed under the highly denaturing conditions provided by the lysis buffer. Once the sample is lysed, a purification procedure is carried out by using a spin column. The sample is loaded onto the spin column. Then a centrifugation is performed. This procedure is a solid phase extraction method in which the stationary phase consists of a silica matrix. Under optimal salt and pH conditions, RNA molecules are bind to the silica gel membrane and at the same time, protein and other contaminants are not retained. After centrifugation the spin column is placed into a clean collection tube and the filtrate is discarded. Then a wash buffer is added. The column is put in a centrifuge again, forcing the wash buffer through the membrane. This removes any remaining impurities from the membrane, leaving only the RNA bound to the silica gel. Once the sample is washed, the column is placed in a clean microcentrifuge tube and an elution buffer is added. Then, a centrifugation is carried out, forcing the elution buffer through the membrane. The elution buffer removes the viral RNA from the spin column. And a purified RNA, which is free of protein, inhibitors, and other contaminants is obtained. After the extraction of the viral RNA, the next step is the preparation of the reaction mixture for PCR amplification. In this step, a master mix is used which is a premixed concentrated solution that consists of buffer, reverse transcriptase enzyme, nucleotides, forward primer, reverse primer, Tachman probe, and DNA polymerase. Finally, to complete this reaction mixture, the RNA template is added. The tube is mixed by pulse vortexing. Then the reaction mixture is loaded into a PCR plate which generally contains 96 wells, allowing the analysis of several samples at the same time. Next, the plate is placed in a PCR machine, which is essentially a thermal cycler. Real-time RT-PCR is used for the detection of the new coronavirus 2019 by the amplification of target sequences in the RDRP gene, the E gene and the N gene. The choice of the target gene depends on the primers and the probe sequences. The first step in RT-PCR is reverse transcription. The first strand complementary DNA synthesis is primed with the PCR reverse primer, which hybridizes to a complementary part of the virus RNA genome. Reverse transcriptase then adds DNA nucleotides onto the three prime end of the primer, synthesizing DNA complementary of the viral RNA. The temperature and duration of this step depend on the primer, the target RNA, and the reverse transcriptase used. Next, an initial denaturation step is applied, causing denaturation of the RNA-DNA hybrids. This step is required for the activation of DNA polymerase and simultaneously the inactivation of reverse transcriptase. PCR consists of a series of thermal cycles, with each cycle consisting of denaturation, annealing, and extension steps. Denaturation step consists of heating the reaction chamber to 95 degrees Celsius and it is used for denaturation of the double-stranded DNA template. In the next step, the reaction temperature is lowered to 58 degrees Celsius, allowing annealing of the forward primer to its complementary part of the single-stranded DNA template. The annealing temperature relies directly on length and composition of the primers. In the extension step, 
The DNA polymer synthesizes a new DNA strand complementary to the DNA template strand by adding free nucleotides from the reaction mixture that are complementary to the template in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The temperature at this step depends on the DNA polymers used. After the first cycle, the double-stranded DNA target is obtained. Then, the denaturation of this double-stranded DNA is performed, yielding two single-stranded DNA molecules. In the next step, the reaction temperature is lowered, allowing annealing of the primers to each of the single-stranded <coughs> DNA templates, and annealing of the Tachman probe to its complementary part of the target DNA. Tachman probe consists of a fluorophore covalently attached to the 5' prime end of the oligonucleotide probe. The fluorescence is emitted by the fluorophore when it is excited by the cycler's light source. Also, this probe consists of a quencher at the 3' prime end. The close proximity of the reporter to the quencher prevents detection of its fluorescence. In the extension step, DNA polymerase synthesizes new strands. When the polymerase reaches a Tachman probe, its endogenous 5' prime nuclease activity cleaves the probe, separating the dye from the quencher. With each cycle of PCR, more dye molecules are released, resulting in an increase in fluorescence intensity, proportional to the amount of amplicant synthesized. This method allows the estimation of the amount of a given sequence present in a sample. The number of double-stranded DNA pieces is doubled in each cycle, therefore, PCR can be used to analyze extremely small amounts of sample. For the measurement of the fluorescence signal, a tungsten halogen lamp, an excitation filter, mirrors, lens, an emission filter, and a charge-coupled device CCD camera are used. Filtered light from the lamp is reflected off-mirror passes through a condensing lens and is focused into the center of each well. Then fluorescent light emitted from the wells reflects off the mirror, passes through an emission filter, and is detected by the CCD camera. In each PCR cycle, light from excited fluorophore can be detected by the CCD camera, which converts the light that it captures into digital data. This method is known as real-time PCR, which allows the monitoring of the progress of the PCR reaction as it occurs in real time. Yeah, is it clear? So that was the summary of your RT-PCR with the COVID perspective. How can you do it? How I can we make things done? Now comes your DNA microarray, which is also quietly used uh, in order to identify between disease state and normal state of cancerous heart disease or anything. Uh, to identify some genes which are present in the disease state and which are not present in the normal state. So in order to identify, we do this DNA microarray, analyzing genome-wide expression, which is a transcriptome analysis. So this consists of thousands of individual gene sequences, which bounds to your closely spaced regions of the surface, glass micro slides of synthesized sequence on chip surface. Uh, it allows the simultaneous analysis of expressions of thousands of genes. And the combination of DNA microarray technology with genome sequencing projects enable scientists to analyze a complete transcriptional program of an organism during specific physiological response or development process. So here on the left hand side you can see fibroblast without serum. On the right hand side you can see fibroblast with serum added. Yeah. And then you isolate total mRNA out of it. Then you reverse transcribe them with the help of complementary DNA with a fluorescent dye of green and red. The one with the serum, we, we uh, dye them with red dye and uh, with the without serum, we did with the green dye in order to differentiate between them. Then we hybridize to the DNA microarray chip um, and then wash and measure green and red fluorescence over each spot. If a green spot is present, that means expression of that genes decreases in the cell after the serum addition. If we see this green spot, uh, then expression of that gene, uh, because these each spot correspond to one gene. So it's an array of uh, 8600 genes. So if you see green ty type, that means that serum, that gene has been decreased. If you see red, that means that ex particular expression is increased in the cells after the serum addition. So these are the cDNA hybridized for a single gene like this. And then you will see some mixture of genes also as a yellow color, uh, having both red and uh, yellow genes present. Uh, to particular gene. So each spot contain many copies of unlabeled DNA probe also uh, 
that means they didn't correspond to any gene and the label corresponding DNA hybridized to spot where there is a sequence. So red plus green yellow which is identical expression level in both sample. Uh, then we represent this data like this each column represent different gene at times different of serum. Uh, so bioinformatic analysis in silico has been help us to map uh, here the biological pathways like glycolysis, cell cycle control and all this. So let's see how we do this uh, DNA expression. Not, not big one this time. I this hope. animation will demonstrate how DNA microarray experiments are performed. DNA microarrays, sometimes called DNA chips, reveal the expression of thousands of genes on a solid surface, such as a microscope slide. In this example, we'll use yeast as a model system to illustrate one use of microarrays. One common use of microarrays is to determine which genes are activated and which are repressed when two populations of cells are compared. Every gene is measured simultaneously. As an example, we'll compare what happens to yeast genes when cells are grown in aerobic versus anaerobic conditions. The cells grow and adjust which genes need to be activated or repressed in order to survive. Now it is time to isolate the mRNA from both populations of cells. The cells are spun in a centrifuge. Now that the cells have gathered in pellets, we remove the liquid, but not the cells. Next, it is time to extract the mRNA from the cells. When we add the extraction buffer, the mRNA is released into the solution. Next, we remove the RNA and place it in a fresh tube. Now, let's make the cDNA from the mRNA. Here we see three of the many mRNA molecules from each tube of cells. Each mRNA is converted into red or green colored cDNA. When the colored cDNA is made, the mRNA degrades. Then we combine the red and green cDNA, mixing both colors into a single tube. At last, <coughs> it's time to look at the DNA microarray. In our experiment, a microarray or DNA chip contains about 6,000 spots. Each spot is a different yeast coding sequence from a different gene. Let's choose three spots at random to follow in detail. Each spot is made of DNA that can base pair with its complementary cDNA. Here are partial sequences from each of the three spots we are observing. Now, let's incubate the mixed cDNA with the DNA chip. For the sake of our example, we'll zoom in and show that some of the labeled cDNA have bound to the DNA in the spots and formed base pairings. Here we see green and red cDNA bound to this spot. Only red cDNA is bound to this spot. And only green cDNA bound to this other spot. In a real experiment, you would not see any of this detail. You would only see the original microarray. Now we must wash off the unbound cDNA to see what is bound to the microarray. Let's detect the bound cDNA so it can be visualized. We begin by placing the microscope slide containing the microarray inside a scanner. We'll examine the next phase of the process, keeping our focus on the three spots we've been following. First, a green laser scans the microarray. The resulting image is stored on a computer for later analysis. Now it's time for the red laser. This image is also stored on a computer for later analysis. Now we move to the analysis phase. After we eject and safely store the microscope slide, we retrieve the red and green images from the computer and create a merged visualization. In the merged image, we see an aerobic gene labeled in green, an anaerobic gene labeled in red, and a gene labeled in yellow that was expressed in both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. This is one example of how DNA microarrays are used. In an actual experiment, quantitative analysis would be conducted on all 6,000 genes.
so that was about dna microarray any questions so far students yeah yeah uh, i will share them tomorrow when we are done with the courses so don't worry about them i'm sharing all the lectures with you each day uh, without any hesitations don't worry about that don't worry so now is the next part in the next 10 minutes we do this investigating genes with biotechnology approaches uh, which is quite important so how can we do this cloning how this is important so mainly it is used for applied therapeutic cloning and creating your gmos genetically modified organisms so in the applied therapeutic cloning we create identical copies of dna interest which has gain of functions analysis then expression of genes in another organisms with the transgenic organisms <clears throat> so to obtain large amount of proteins to investigate the functions of proteins for in animal models and generate functional dna molecules for gene therapy in gene related diseases on the otherwise gmo is done to create healthy proteins within our uh, species uh, transgenic animals which could produce more uh, better results uh, for healthy animals for improved production uh, potential so dna cloning uh, is mainly done with help of a plasmid vector how is a plasmid vector is made up of which is a self replicating dna molecule um, so here on the left hand side uh, you can see that on the right hand side polylinker that is a multiple cloning site where various restriction enzymes could be added then there is mp mpcelin restriction mpcelin resistance uh, uh, gene is present which will help to resist this ampicillin uh, bacteria and then there's a, a origin of replication site here so this is the region into which exogenous dna can be inserted uh, whichever you want to be uh, get inserted here so in combined dna technology which enables to produce large number of identical dna molecules here the clones are typically generated by placing a dna fragment of interest in the vector dna molecule which can replicate into the bacterial host cells and two common vectors are e coli plasmid vectors and bacteriophage a lambda vector so what is happening basically very basic principle here that is that what you can see is you have a plasmid vector and the dna fragment that you want to insert into it then enzymatically insert into the plasmid vector you have a recombinant plasmid then we insert them with the help of uh, calcium chloride and and on the nutrient agar medium containing ampicillin so your bacterial chromosome is there and your transformed e coli which will survive they will be present then the cells which do not survive um they they will take up the plasmid dna and plasmid and does not survive on this plate they will die then independent plasmid replications will happen then the cell multiplication is done then you have lot of uh, dna molecule uh, sorry a plasmid vector being produced clones of cells containing copies co copies of a same recombinant plasmid very simple very basics uh, that's how you do it some another way of doing it having uh, multiple clones Uh, with the different colors here as it presented, and then you have different uh, resistance clones being present like this. So each clone will represent one clone here. And beyond that, restriction enzymes uh, during the cloning cut at a specific sequence. They also have a very important role. They are known for cutting a specific side of your DNAs and generating double-stranded breaks. Um, there are so far 600 naturally occurring uh, RE uh, in the market. and they recognize four to six base pair sequences mostly so like e coli 1 it will cut from g part here g part here leading to produce a palindrome which will spell both from the uh, if you read from the right hand side or left hand side they will read the same like ana oto rada kaya and these are some examples of restriction enzymes here you can see that bam h1 sau 3a e coli hen 3 smai not l Uh, whose source organisms are Bacillus, Amelicofaceans, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Escherichia coli, Haemophilus influenza, like so, and the recognition sites are being also shown for the same that they will recognize these following sequences leading to production of 
uh, sticky ends uh, but in this case with SCM it will produce blunt end because it's cutting from the center but if it's cutting from the right hand side it will always give us sticky sticky ends so some restriction fragments with complementary sticky ends are ligated easily so here we can see DNA1 and DNA2 so there's OH and TTAA uh, so the one which can recognize these sites will be attached here automatically so for example in, in corresponding to TTA it will be AATT so they will come and join here and with the help of DNA ligase and ATP we will have a recombinant DNA at the end so one very nice video about Plasmids can be good cloning vectors because they carry an origin of replication and are therefore able to replicate independently within a cell. Most plasmids used as vectors also encode some type of selectable marker, such as the gene for resistance to ampicillin. If the host cells are ampicillin sensitive, the only host cells that can grow on a medium containing ampicillin are those that have taken up the plasmid. Vectors must also have a small sequence of base pairs that can be recognized by a restriction enzyme. When this enzyme opens the circular plasmid, foreign DNA can be incorporated. When the plasmid vector and foreign DNA are both cut with the same restriction enzyme and mixed together, not all molecules will join to form recombinants. Some vector molecules will reanneal without incorporating foreign DNA. To identify cells that contain plasmids that have incorporated foreign DNA, a second marker gene is needed on the vector. This second marker contains the restriction enzyme site within its nucleotide sequence. If foreign DNA is inserted, the second marker is inactivated. This is referred to as insertional inactivation. A common second marker is the LAC-Z gene, which codes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase can cleave a colorless chemical called XGAL to form a blue compound. Therefore, colonies of cells that harbor the intact vector, but no new recombinant DNA, can make beta-galactosidase and form a blue color in the presence of XGAL. However, colonies that contain new recombinant DNA cannot make beta-galactosidase and are white. So that was the thing that I was telling before. There's also some polylinkers uh, uh, which will have sequence of polylinkers like many sites for the um, your restriction enzymes. So they will get attached to your uh, plasmid vector with the help of E. coli. Uh, the one which will attach will be act as a recombinant plasmid. Another example in order to remove your mixture of RNAs. So complementary DNA libraries are pre prepared from isolating the mRNA. So it will have your ribosomal RNA, tRNA, mRNA. So what you do is you take some oligo DT matrix which have all the TTT and your mRNA uh, which will have this AA at the end they will get attached to this oligo DT primers and we wash away the ribosomal RNA and tRNA then elute with the uh, low salt buffer and the end you have purified mRNA preparation so <clears throat> to identify analyze sequence of clone DNA so we can do it by screening library or we can do with the southern and northern blotting or direct sequencing which is applied to this uh, part of sequencing technique. So that's it for today. So tomorrow we will start with sequencing part with the Sanger sequencing and uh, next generation sequencing. How they have changed our life, how things have been uh, totally changed uh, regarding the sequence of one human being. So earlier days it used to be uh, very expensive to sequence our body but now it's easy to sequence. Uh, it's not a big deal and uh, good to go for our, ourselves. So that's it. Uh, tomorrow we will see us to, uh, same time, same place and we try to complete this task also, day 3 workshop and then we go for the next one. So thank you very much. Stay safe. Uh, don't go much outside and yeah, pray. I would say for the whole world. Thank you. Bye-bye.